So a little bit of the backstory on the reading that Dave started us off with from Philippians is that we find that Paul is in prison. And while he was in prison, he had a choice to make. He could have chosen to be bitter and focus on the negative and all that had gone wrong, all that he had lost. But instead we find that he chooses to focus on the positive, on all that was right and all that he still had. And I would imagine that this letter is just as much a pep talk for him as it was for the people of Philippi. And being in prison, he had every reason to feel a sense of depression and loss of hope. But instead, he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. He had every reason to complain and plead with God about his dire circumstances or even to blame God and turn away. But instead, he writes, With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He had every reason to look on the dark side of his circumstances, but instead he writes, Whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul had every reason to give up, but instead he wrote, I press on. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. So it does seem like Paul was writing to himself as much as maybe he was writing for others. And I believe that we are not always free to determine what happens to us, but we are relatively free to choose how we will respond to whatever happens. Because no one, and I think most of us know this, no one, absolutely no one, asks for addiction to take over their lives. But there is a choice in being able to seek out help, and there is a choice in not having to take another drink or drug again. There is a choice in how everyone in the family chooses to respond to addiction when it enters a family's life. And as someone has said, we cannot revoke what has happened at the level of the event, but we can rework it at the level of significance. And that choice... How we respond to whatever happens makes all the difference in the world. I think it's a helpful reminder for all of us that we do have a choice in the circumstances of life, the same choice that Paul had in prison, and that choice is to be thankful and to seek out those things that we can be grateful for. In those difficult situations in life, we all have the choice of what we will maximize and what we will minimize. And the person who has learned to choose gratitude for the positive in the midst of the negative is far better equipped to cope with whatever comes and to make the best of things in the worst of times. And I would hope that each one of us would strive to make that choice. I asked one of our alumni if I could share this story with you Because as I told him yesterday, he was my Advent prophet yesterday. Because I think it's what Paul is writing about, and there's just so much we can learn from him. So our alumni had gotten a root canal, and he had declined any pain medications other than ibuprofen. And for any of you that have had periods of time in recovery or in recovery, you know that that first time you're kind of faced with either a dental procedure or a surgery or something, it's really terrifying to figure out what to do about pain medication. So he stuck with ibuprofen. And then after a few days, the pain was getting worse, and he discovered that it had gotten infected. He was given penicillin and hydrocodone, which he didn't want to take but finally needed to for the amount of pain that he was in. And after the infection went down, they discovered that the tooth that was behind the tooth that had had a root canal was badly infected, and it was rotted out where you could see the root, and it needed to be pulled. That meant two more days on pain pills. And he wrote that having to take those pills really threw me for a loop because I was afraid of losing my sobriety, but I didn't. It's the first time in my life that I took a prescription for painkillers as prescribed. I didn't take them to get high. And nonetheless, 
the fear of relapse was genuine, and it was very easy a possibility. But I made it through. I stayed in contact with my brothers and sisters in recovery. I told them what was happening. He gave his pill bottle to his wife to administer, and they helped me each day. But then he added this. He's like, but wait, there's more. I finally lost something in sobriety. I lost my job. He'd had the job for two years, and he lost his job. And he said, here is a perfect storm set up for relapse. I was upset, but I immediately started praying for everyone in this situation. It was a rough day, and I noticed a liquor store that I used to buy booze at and decided it would be a really great idea to go to a 12-step meeting. (coughs) After that, I called my sponsor. God, my 12-step program, my sponsor, my wife, the brothers and sisters in recovery have helped me through all of this, and I've stayed sober. I didn't want to tell everyone about what was going on as it was happening because I wanted to see how everything was going to work out. But instead, I called people because I know that God will help me through to the other side of my difficulties because God hasn't failed me yet. So for me, in reading this and then talking to him on the phone yesterday, his words reflect so much of what Paul is writing. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen, and the God of peace will be with you. Our alumni finished his post with these words, Thank you, God, for blessing this alcoholic with sobriety just for today. If anyone reading this is having trouble with alcohol and or drugs, I'm here for you. Please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to help you. And he goes on to say, as a friend of mine says, I'm available to be your sober friend. I just think that is such a beautiful and powerful example of someone reflecting the peace of God which surpasses all understanding in the midst of of pain, in the midst of fear, in the midst of losing his job, reflecting the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. And in that, that peace will guard your hearts, it will guard your minds, and it will guard your sobriety. Because we also know that addiction loves to feed off of shame. It loves secrecy, and it loves isolation. And so when I talked to him yesterday, he shared with me that on the way home from the ER, it was probably 4.35 in the morning, he just started calling people. He started calling everybody in his phone just to let them know what was going on and get support back from them. And he said this was crucial. For me, This is his willingness to be authentic and to be vulnerable and to trust God and his support system to help him through a really difficult time. And I see in him a willingness to be real. And in that, kind of a charge for all of us to be real with ourselves, to be real with one another, and to be real with God. On the surface, it can seem so much easier to put on a mask and pretend. But if we allow ourselves to fully experience those dark periods in our lives and everything that comes with it, we will be ready for the joy that comes in the morning. So in that, there's kind of a call for us to be brave enough to be real, to be completely present to each moment as we wait with expectation for what God is going to do next. There are seasons in our lives And certainly being in treatment is one of those seasons where we wait in the dark for God's light to come. But as we wait, perhaps God is inviting us to make a change from within. In your prayers, your thoughts, your hopes and dreams, your attitudes, your ideas about yourself, your perception about others, what changes do you need to make to allow God to bring about new life within you? When I feel that movement to make those choices in my life, 
it's going back to that place of believing that God wants what's best for us. And so when you peel back the layers of the questions and the wonderings that most of us have about our lives, I come to the conclusion that whatever good fortune and excess, success and health I enjoy, that we enjoy, is not something that I necessarily deserve or have earned, but it's a gift. And it's a gift of God's grace. And in that, I choose to be grateful. Keeping it in this perspective also helps with that practice of humility, just keeping things in perspective. I just returned from a wonderful trip home. And when I'm home, one of my favorite things to do is just to go out on the prairie and watch the sunset. And a few sunrises, but I hit more sunsets and sunrises. And spending time with my family and just lifelong friends. And this time at home also kind of makes me want to push our reading back a bit further and relate it to a choice we make in response to those fundamental questions that I think all of us ask at one time or another. It's a question that comes to us when we realize the infinite variety of possible genetic combinations and we ask ourselves, why was I born to the parents that I was born with too? For me, why was I born in South Dakota and into my specific family? Why were we born with a particular mixture of genes, our talents, our gifts, and our disposition? Well, some might choose to respond to these questions by calling it chance or fate or an accident. But I like to look at it that life is a gift. And it certainly doesn't answer all of our questions, and it certainly doesn't answer all the questions that we may have about suffering, but there is something that compels me to answer it this way, that life is essentially a gift. And we heard that from some of the people this morning who were talking about what they're grateful for today, just that chance to be alive, that chance for another day. Each day of life is a gift of God's grace. And instead of looking at it as being entitled or something which I deserve, what if we looked at my life and your life, the lives of our loved ones, and all that we have as gifts, and recognizing that gift with humility and choosing to be grateful for all that we have in this day and all that we have in our lives? What we can learn from Paul And what we can learn from our alumni who shared his story is for us to give thanks to God for the gift of life with our prayers of gratitude. But also to express our gratitude not just in words, but also in our deeds. In helping to give that gift of life in all of its fullness to others. And we do that by being of service. By being of service to the next person that walks in the door. By sharing our gratitude with the people around us. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen. I think Jim shared that with us earlier. Following those few simple suggestions and the God of peace will be with you. That peace of God, which does surpass all understanding, that peace will guard your hearts. It will guard your minds, and in that, it does guard your sobriety. Amen.